Hello again, ladies and gents. Sorry to interrupt your conversations. Um, I just would like to do so for the next 15, 20 minutes or so as we introduce our guest speaker. And as I, uh, as I mentioned um, earlier, he's, he's come in at very short notice. Uh, Sally Orange unfortunately had to postpone, but I'm, I'm so glad that we've got Martin with us. Um, I met, uh, I came across Martin a week or two ago uh, after a webinar that I was on. Um, and, you know, we've been blessed by having some really inspirational and motivational people, but I've got to say that Martin is is right up there. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit why. He He's a Paralympian, he's a table tennis player. Um, but Martin was born with a condition called congenital limb loss and deformity, meaning Martin was born with no hands and only one leg. And the natural progression is to become a professional a table tennis player and a Paralympian. Um, his his story is, is fascinating. I'm going to invite him up onto the screen now, so it should be coming through to you, Martin. Perfect. Hello. <laughs> Hello, Martin. Hi, mate. How are you? You okay? Yeah, very good. Thank you. Very well. Good, good. Well, Martin, uh, as I say, thank you, firstly, for jumping in at, at short notice. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm so delighted you, you, you're you able to join us. Um, before we get into the Q&A, just to say to attendees that on the right-hand side of the screen, you'll see a Q&A um, area. Feel free to enter any questions throughout our conversation, uh, and I'll, I'll address them with Martin as, as we go. But um, I'll set a little bit of context there, Martin, in terms of what you do as a, as a Paralympian, as a table tennis player, and the beauty of uh, online online events and online networking you're in scotland at the moment and we're on the south coast um so that's a, that's of england that is that's uh that's that's the way of the world at the moment but um firstly martin how's lockdown treating you as, a, as an athlete everything's on hold but what's life like in lockdown for you um obviously in the beginning it was it was very difficult you know um I've actually been on lockdown for an additional two weeks to everyone else. Uh, I was I was a, a participant in the Spanish Open uh, two weeks before the UK went into official lockdown. But on return from the, the Spanish Open, we were put into into quarantine just to obviously reduce the risk of, you know, potential spread of the virus and things like that. So I've been in Scotland, um, which isn't, I mean, as I'm sure you can tell by my voice, it's my native home. <laughs> But um, I'm usually based in Sheffield and, you know, so I've, I've been in Scotland for an additional two weeks to the entire, the entire uh, lockdown. And it, in, in the beginning, it was actually, it was very difficult because um, for, for someone like myself, who is an athlete, is all I want to do is, is go and practice my craft and train and compete and having that taken away from me, you know, it's very difficult to replicate high level table tennis um, without a training partner and obviously a table tennis table which if you've played they're quite they're quite you know in terms of if you want to try and fit one in the house so it's not something that's been easy for me um but i've been trying you know lots of different training techniques and methods to try and combat that and get around it and it's been uh, it's been a long <laughs> one and as i'm sure you're all aware scotland's uh we're a couple of weeks behind you guys so um not just in terms of the weather <laughs> in terms of the rules and regulations so um so yeah so we are we are just you know um doing as we're told and, and, and trying to make trying to make the best yeah, of it. Yeah, fantastic. Really. And uh, in your full time, um, full time in, in your craft, uh, table tennis. And uh, but we'll go we'll go all the way back if we if, if we're able to and talk about what life was like growing up. As, as I set some context earlier, you were born with congenital limb loss and deformity. Um, what was life growing up like for you? The, the first thing that comes to mind was obviously it, it was fun. But for me, it was fun because I'm fortunate enough to have three older brothers, um, you know, so they're all completely able-bodied. And obviously, when I when I was born, as you said, the congenital limb loss. So I'll show you guys. So my right arm, uh, I've got my elbow and it stops just below my wrist. So I've got decent rotation and movement there. Uh, my left arm stops through the elbow joint. So I've got no forearm on that side. And uh, I, I don't I don't have the lower half of my left leg. Uh, so I've always had a prosthetic leg that I've used used uh, on that side. But the main the main thing for me growing up was the fact that I had my brothers and, you know, they they were my support network. They, for want of a better word, just bullied me <laughs> into doing whatever they were doing. You know, there was no there was no um, sympathy or anything. They just made sure that I joined in and everything that they were doing, um, which usually was a lot of mischief and trouble. So um, 
my poor mother, she had a lot to deal with, four young boys running about, but you know, it was it was fun and, and they made sure that I was a participant in everything that they were doing and everything that kids my age were doing and you know, whether that was sports or you know, school work or any, anything that, that, that entailed just being a child, they made sure that I did that and I've got a lot to thank to them for that experience. Yeah, so you, how influential would you say that they are, particularly in putting that competitive nature into you? And I, reading your website, uh, there was a really funny line that you used that your brothers used to put you in goal when you played football because they thought you weren't going to save in it and that gave you that yeah. th- that gave you that <laughs> determination to uh, to prove them wrong. So would you say that they, they were really inspirational in kind of that competitive competitive nature and installing that but also sort of being the best you can be absolutely absolutely you know as you said they, they would they would stick me in goals um thinking well he's got no hands he's not going to save the ball so we can score loads of goals and pretend you know that we're the best footballers in the world and that just made me be like right well that this isn't on you know because the for those in the chat that have siblings you'll know what that rival is like you know you you, you want to be the best you want to win and and that just got and you know that was threefold for me because they were all they were all older than me I had three of them to compete to be the best and you know so by them putting me in goals and and that was their that was their way of like trying to have a joke where I was like right well I'll show you that I'm going to be better and I would work really hard that you know being super competitive and trying to stop all the balls going in so so that upbringing definitely instilled a massive competitive drive within me. Yeah fantastic and you tried lots of different sports when you were growing up but what was your inspiration to get into table tennis? What was that moment that you went, that's the that's the sport that I want to dedicate myself to? It was um, it was through a summer camp when I was in high school. And um, we tried, as you said, loads of different sports. Obviously, I'd played sports my whole life. Um, but on this, on this final day of the summer camp in high school, I met these, I thought, were really cool guys playing table tennis. So they were there from the local club in the area, showing the kids, all, all disabled kids, how to, how to play the sport and have fun. And it just kind of, it went from there, you know, we, in the beginning, it was so primitive and basic. We basically, for me to hold the bat, wrapped a, wrapped a dishcloth around my arm um, and then locked it in, which made like a sort of sleeve and, um, underneath my forearm. And then we slid the bat in the sleeve and then uh, like Velcro wrapped around the dishcloth just to secure the bat in place. And it was, it was so awful, uh, but it was really fun. And as I said, obviously that competitive side of me came out. I then went and got prosthetics made that I could play, um, you know, at, at a decent level. And again, that competitive drive just, just spurred me on and, and, and moved me into a more serious position. But ultimately, the reason I wanted to pursue table tennis was that I was having so much fun playing it. And obviously, I still do, you know, so it was that, that fun aspect of it. And I, I'm so thankful that I get to compete all over the world when the rest of the world becomes open again. Mm. And you referenced uh, London 2012 being a really uh, big inspiration for you as well. And a lot of the athletes that you saw competing there and now your teammates, that must be quite a surreal, uh, a surreal thing for you. Yeah, what an experience that was. Um, I was fortunate enough to, you know, if anyone in this chat went to the game, you had to, you know, put your name and almost name in a hat. And if you got, if you got pulled out, you got a ticket sometimes. And uh, I was lucky enough to get, tickets for the the bronze medal matches um at the team event at london 2012 and i went down and seen these absolute you know in my eyes just gods just you know battling it out on the table the best of the best and i was like wow they are they are so cool and and that definitely was um was the spark that i think you know lit the fact that I, i'm going to dedicate my life to this you know they're um for want of a better word they were so disabled and yet so able to to do whatever they wanted and i was like right well i'm gonna copy them and emulate them and then you know within i think a space of three since the games um i was living with these guys and you know training with them every day and we're going out for dinners and it was just it happened so quick that i was like wow this is uh this is you know just awesome so um yeah london 2012 definitely was a massive, uh, you know, kickstarter for me to, to go and pursue the sport at a higher level. And, you know, now these guys are not just teammates, they're friends, friends that I'll have for life. And yeah, they, yeah. they definitely inspire me. And let's um, talk a little bit about your mindset. And this is a, a lot that we see between sportsmen and uh, business people. Um, and a lot of our members enjoy hearing about the mindset of athletes and particularly yourself about overcoming such adversity. Um, you know, 
how what what inspires you what keeps you going what motivates you because i'm sure like a lot of businesses there are ups and downs but what's what really keeps your motivation um i think you know it's, it's no matter what i do i, I you know it's, it's a bit of a cliche but i just genuinely want to be the best that i can be um and and you know in terms of inspiration i think a lot of the times um, I don't know if it's a if it's a Scottish attitude, but you know it's a, a lot of negative reinforcement, you know, and that could come from having my brothers as well. But I, I I draw a lot of inspiration from the really rubbish crap times that I've had in my career. You know, the the, the big losses and and the, the close defeats and and things that have really been a major setback. Because I think especially to to draw inspiration to move forward, that's what you remember is that you know that ugly feeling of of defeat. And, you know, I, I use that a lot when I work with my psychologist is to actually can can we change that that feeling of, of, of defeat and, and being down and, and things like that? And can we use that as fire and fuel to go again? And I feel like for me, that makes that makes a massive impact, you know, and uh, I've spoke to a lot of other Scottish athletes and it tends to be a recurrent theme that, you know, it's that that negative reinforcement like that was crap, that was rubbish go and do it better and then it sort of fires you up so for me for me that definitely works um but yeah I think just just trying to be the best that I can absolutely be and you know hopefully along the way that I can show people that are able-bodied and people that have disabilities similar to myself that you know if, if I can play table tennis to such a high level having no hands um, and only one leg then you know what else can be achieved and I just ultimately want yeah and how important would you say the mind is over over the body um you know you you reference your psychologist how important have they been in your career and how important are they to other athletes that you know how, how important i think for me a, a sports psychologist that we get to work with um day in day out is, is is paramount to our success you know there's there's a reason that everyone's heard the the saying you know mind over matter and um the reason everyone's heard that is because i, I totally believe that it's true you know it's um it's not necessarily what you can do it's what you think you can do and if you think you can do something you, you're definitely in a much better space to go and achieve that you know and um so as going back to that whole sort of negative reinforcement where i'm sitting there feeling a bit crap or down or you know someone's told me i can't do something well actually that's when my mind switches and it's like right well i'll show you that i can you know i'll show you that this ugly feeling doesn't have to be the consistent thought in my head i'm going to change it to a positive i'm going to go work harder and, and push on from there so um, you know, psychology in general, um, but obviously in a sport and performance aspect for me, it, it's, it's paramount. Yeah. And let's bring it forward to the today. And, and much like a lot of businesses and much like a lot of people that this year in this current situation has really pushed back a lot of their plans. More so, perhaps more so for you, you had your you were fully focused on Tokyo 2020, but now it's Tokyo 2021. How has that changed your mindset in terms of your your competition, your training, you know, how, how, take us into your mind about how, how that, uh, how that feels as an athlete. I think initially, like, you know, probably I'd say everyone, um, when, when this whole situation of, of lockdown and, you know, travel bans and, and, and everything that encompassed this virus for me, it felt like a massive sucker punch, you know, um, I missed out on, I think three, possibly four competitions that could have helped me qualify for Tokyo and put me in a better position going forward. Um, so I felt initially that I was robbed of these opportunities. You know, I'd worked so hard to get in uh, because of something that I can't control. I I now can't, you know, qualify for the games directly and things like that. So um, for me, it felt like a sucker punch. And, and, and then, you know, there was this saving grace that, well, it's all right because, you know, the situation is not too bad. We'll be able to get back out. Um, in May to the World Qualification Tournament, where there was one, there was going to be one tournament at the beginning of May, um, and it was like a a golden ticket, a, 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 as you will, you know, it was winner takes all. If you won that tournament, you got to go to the Paralympic Games. Now that's obviously been postponed to next year, um, but I had built all this up in my head because the the day that the final was to be scheduled at this World Qualification Tournament was actually my twenty fifth birthday. So I was like, right, I'm going to give myself the best birthday present ever. I'm going to give myself a spot at the Paralympic Games. And then obviously, you know, that all got swept away from under my feet. And I was, you know, I was upset. And I was like, right, well, you know, this, this is crap. I don't want to feel like this. 
Um, and the main thing, as I said, I spoke to a psychologist and it was like, well, what can we control? I can control how I react to this situation. You know, so I now know that this tournament is going to go ahead again. That's been confirmed for um, later on in 2021, sort of just before the games. You know, so I've now got at least another 12 months to go and train and work harder and make sure that actually in 12 months time, I'm going to be in an even better position than what I was coming into the end of this qualification period so that I can give myself the best opportunity to go and hopefully qualify, you know. So it was it was tough because, you know, it, things were changing day by day. You know, we were told, right, this tournament's cancelled, then it might be back on and then, okay, we'll start training again together on this day and things like that. It's just a constant change, whereas I've learned in this period of time that, you know, it's um, we use it in, in sports like just control the controllables. You know, if, if something's out with our control, you know, yes, it's okay to put a thought on it and be aware of it, but if we let that overrun us, it's, it's going to be detrimental to the performance because ultimately we can't control the situation. So I think it's just about making sure that we do as best as what we can with what we're given. Yeah, we're hearing that a lot as well within businesses as well, being able to, you know, you can only control the controllables. So uh, actually, lastly, from me, we've got a, a couple of questions coming in, so we will get... Sorry, Martin, I accidentally left the screen there. I was panicking there. No, no, no. <laughs> Sorry, the, the floor was yours there for a second. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I was just going to finish around goal setting. So a lot of businesses here will be setting goals short, medium, long term as best they possibly can. So is that something that you and your team applies as well? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you, you stole my whole tagline there of short, medium and long goals. You know, it's uh, it's something we definitely do. You know, we sit down, we, we work um, in reverse. So we, we picture the, the big goal. Um, so whether that be... So for me, the big goal is Paralympic gold medal. Now, that doesn't necessarily say that uh, that has to come at Tokyo or Paris. It could come after that at LA. But for me, so we put it in big, big right and circle around the Paralympic gold medal. That's the big goal. And then, so we, that's the long-term goal. We work back the way, right? So what's going to get me to the standard of Paralympic champion, right? It's going to be looking at the history books and the records, it's going to be, I have to be within top six in the world. How do I get to top six in the world? X amount of competitions to get the ranking points and I have to get so many wins on them. So it's all about the processes and making sure that those processes line up to the next stage. Um, mm. But yeah, when, when we do it, we, we work in reverse, uh, you know, and go from, go from the large scale to the small in order to, to make sure that, you know, it's, that, that actually if we, if we set the goals too big, then we're only going to increase our odds of m making that goal. Does that make sense? You know, yeah. so if I go for something super out of the way, like I'm going to be Paralympic champion, that makes me the best in the world. If I don't hit that goal, I'm probably still going to be pretty close. Hmm. You know, um, yeah. so yeah, <laughs> that's how we do it. Great. Well, uh, let's take a couple of questions uh, from attendees uh, before we wrap up. So, a good one that's been voted to the top. If you could give one piece of advice for your younger self, what would it be? Oh, um, look after my hairline a little bit better. <laughs> um, I've been bald since I was 20. Um, no, for me, I think it's just um, just keep, keep, keep having fun. You know, it's something that you, you, you take for granted as a kid. You know, I've got, I've got nine nieces and nephews. Um, and it's something that I, I love FaceTiming them, especially during this time, because they're not getting to see their friends and, and things like that at school. And, and I try and I, I don't mind acting a clown for them. You know, it makes it makes my day a lot better. And um, so it's just to, to bring and, and things like that. That's what I would tell myself, because I've always been very driven and I've always been very motivated to, to improve myself. And I think sometimes along that journey and even still today, sometimes I of the fun of it you know and um, that was one of the first things my my first table tennis coach told me he says no matter how successful you get once you stop having fun get out you mm. know and um, so that that's what I would tell my younger self other than obviously you know look at get a comb or something and brush it <laughs> so it's nice and thick but yeah <laughs> uh, look, I, I think those that uh, 
those that are bald like yourself, you, you're you're benefiting at the moment. I haven't seen my barber <laughs> since, since March. This is getting taller and taller. A um, couple couple more. Um, one relating to your uh, your your profession, but also uh, one personal. Uh, how have you managed training at home? Um, so I, I won't lie. I'll be honest. And um, the first week, as I said, when I felt that sucker punch, you know, that first seven to ten days, I was feeling a bit sorry for myself. I was like, oh, I can't train. I'm not doing anything. Um, and I, I got a little bit lazy, you know, and I then I, I accepted that. I was like, that's, you know, and, and talking to other athletes, you know, I came to the conclusion that, that was probably quite a natural reaction, you know, was to get a bit like, oh, this is a bit rubbish. Um, and, and things start to switch off. And then I was like, OK, right, actually, uh, I, can, I can turn this into a positive. If I can use this time to go and work on myself. So um, something that I can't do when I'm in a regular training program is go out running um, because I'm on my feet all day playing table tennis. If I go and run and injure myself, you know, that's it. I'm in big trouble. So um, I spoke to the physio uh, and the strength and conditioning coach. And I was like, look, I'm off the table, you know, like everyone else is we can't train properly. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to go do some, I'm going to go do some running. And they were, they were all on board. They were like, absolutely. You know, and now, now is the chance that you can go and push your cardio fitness um, to, to hopefully a new level because you're not having to worry about coming back on the table to prepare for, you know, a big competition or such. And then, um, you know, I reached out to a few folk on Instagram and uh, I was looking for an exercise bike um, and, and I was fortunate enough to be, to be given an exercise bike so that I can, I can work on, you know, the fitness in the home, uh, you know, as everyone in this chat will be aware of the weather in Scotland is usually quite miserable. <laughs> So to stay inside and still get a really good cardiovascular exercise going for me is key. Um, and I've been doing a lot more yoga and stuff because the way, because my, my body is so mismatched in terms of the limbs being different lengths, um, for me just to say, stay flexible and stay loose is, is, is so key. So that I get that naturally through table tennis from all the dynamic movement. Um, and now that I'm missing table tennis, you know, I'll wake up in the morning, my back's a lot sore because it's not that general movement and twisting in action. So I've done a lot more yoga and things like that. Um, so, yeah, there's definitely loads of options out there that you can keep fit. Um, but for me, training is obviously different at this moment in time. I'm getting a lot of funny looks from my neighbours when I go out the back door and we do something called uh, shadow play. So I, I basically go in, I strap the bat up to my arm and I'm out in the garden basically dancing about, pretending that I'm playing table tennis. <laughs> But what the neighbours don't see is that I've got my iPad at my feet and my coach is shouting at me to do certain things. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I can see them at the windows just like, what, what is he doing? He's, he's yeah. absolutely nuts. Um, so we call that shadow play um, because we're basically, you know, mimicking the movements of table tennis. But what um, a lot of folk don't realise is we actually do that as a warm up in the table tennis hall, you know, because it's a good way to get the heart rate up and and. and and get ready for a session so it's it's been difficult especially in the beginning but you know I'm, I'm getting used to it now it's the new the new normal as they say yeah that's becoming the phrase but great lastly um martin um this one seems very popular if you were hosting a dinner party and could invite four people dead or alive who would they be and why oh, i hate this question i get it so <laughs> much and I well, you should know, know the answer then. It, no because it changes all the time it changes all the time um for me I, well Okay, this week I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go Michael Jordan. I've just watched his um, last dance on Netflix. That was awesome. So I want to see what it's like, you know, coming from a different athlete who just dominated uh, so much. Um, I want to sit down with uh, Barack Obama, just because not obviously for what he does a political point of view, but just for I, I love the man's voice. So I think he could just talk to me <laughs> about absolute nonsense, and I'd be like, yeah, that's that's great. So I love it. Um, he's got a great voice. Um, two more, I would have to say. I think I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with David Beckham. Actually, um, I used to watch him growing up. I'm a big Man U fan. Sorry if I've offended anyone else in the chat there, but I'm a big Man U fan, and uh, I watched him growing up. And I just yeah. So David Beckham, and I think uh, lastly, it's very sport orientated. I'm choosing three athletes here because I'm put on the spot. And you should have asked me that question earlier. So I knew about <laughs> it. Uh, last one, I'm going to say I'm going to say Lewis Hamilton. Actually, um, I love my F1 as well, and I think the fact that he's just going from strength to strength. I think he's actually going to beat Michael Schumacher's record if he gets mm -hmm. the chance. Um, so yeah, so 
great. That's my no, 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 that that didn't come from me. That was from the floor, so I, I didn't see that one coming. But, um, but thanks. I blocked it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thanks uh, very much, Martin. We'll uh, we'll let you get on, or you're welcome to stay uh, within the event. I know you're you're a keen networker yourself, and you're always happy to build up relationships. So do stick around. But um, uh, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, I'll take you off the screen. Uh, but thanks again, Martin. Uh, Martin Perry, ladies Thank and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Great, thank you uh, to Martin. And now we'll get back into uh, the, uh, the networking and, and what we do for the last round uh, in Remo, a three 10-minute table rotations.